Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection, of course, as usual. Um, today I would like to talk about the polynomial. So polynomials are pretty cool, but not any polynomial, the so-called tat polynomial. Well, okay, such a name for a polynomial, fine, hmm, who cares? But the point is, this is kind of um, kind of counting polynomial, a kind of really funny counting polynomial um, that appears in graph theory. Yes, graph theory. So when I first learned about it, I was a little bit shocked, like polynomials. Yeah, of course, we all know polynomials by now. They appear in like everywhere in mathematics, honestly. Uh, maybe you for the first time you see them in analysis or some kind of calculus, uh, but they are really at the heart of algebra. So algebra is really like polynomials. But graph theory, graph theory sounds a bit weird, right? I mean, first time you hear, hear, hear about this, mm, graph theory, polynomials, doesn't quite want to fit together, at least for me, it didn't quite want to fit together. But um, yeah, it actually fits very well. And the stat polynomial is a really cool polynomial associated to a graph that kind of counts a lot of things you like to count on a graph, right? You would, would like to count whatever, like number of cycles or something for, for a given graph. And you can encode that in a polynomial, which is a really, really cool idea. And which was kind of the, the beginning of a huge story of polynomials in discrete mathematics in graph theory. Maybe in discrete mathematics, polynomials were known before, but certainly in graph theory, it was one of the first and one of the most interesting polynomials. Nowadays, of course, they are kind of a more interesting polynomials, whatever that means, more beefed up, beefed up polynomials, nicer polynomials with more information. Um, but this was a really nice. It's extremely simple. It's just ridiculously simple, you will see. Um, and it's kind of surprising that people haven't thought about that before. Uh, so let's get let's just get started, right? So let's stop waffling and get started. So um, a, a graph is really simple, right? It's this thing here, like here, this is a graph. It has vertices in this picture. They're numbered from one up to uh, six, something. Um, and kind of the most crucial part about a graph are actually the, the edges connecting all the vertices. I'm not going to mark all of them. That just takes too long. Well, I'm too lazy um, to get the point. So you have those vertices, so whatever, and you have some edges between them, whatever. Could be double edges, could be loops, something like this. Um, yeah, and it's a really cool way of kind of illustrating a lot of, well, kind of things that happen in mathematics, in life in general. So graphs are really, really applicable. They appear everywhere. You can kind of model everything in a graph. It's kind of a, a flow chart diagram without extra information. It's really just the nodes and the edges. And a lot of, you might want to count a lot of numerical data associated. I call it numerical data. You will see in a second what I mean. Numerical data associated to a graph. And usually you would just count them like the number of vertices. You just count one, two, three, four, five, six, six, great. The number of edges, you would just count, I have no idea, one, two, three, four, five, seven, apparently. I hope I haven't miscounted. Ooh, that took way too long. Um, and so on. So number of vertices, number of edges, you could count something more sophisticated, number of uh, cycles, for example, here would be one, or whatever, something, something like that. And this might be really cool. Uh, or important to, to have some kind of general machinery to do this because now graphs appear everywhere in mathematics, appear everywhere in sciences, appear everywhere in real life. And it, it's always good to have some general uh, machinery to get some numerical data associated to your graph. And kind of the most important question that comes up for today, at least in this today's talk, is maybe we shouldn't study numerical data, so numbers, associated to a graph, but rather a whole polynomial, right? A polynomial is more than a number. Why is a polynomial more than a number? Well, evaluating a polynomial at certain points gives you numbers, but you can evaluate at many points. A polynomial is in some sense a collection of numbers, right? So instead of studying a collection of numbers with extra properties, it's not just a set of numbers. It's uh, You can add polynomials, you can multiply polynomials. You get the gist of it. Um, yeah, so the kind of main question, it's kind of the, the question here, it's kind of find a polynomial. And of course, you just not any polynomial, any old polynomial, but the polynomial should in, uh, encode some properties of your graph, right? So you have a given graph and you want to find a polynomial that encodes properties. It's of course a weak question and seems a bit unmotivated. And I find it very surprising that this actually has an extremely satisfying answer. An extremely good answer, right? So um, it's kind of 
asking this question in the first place was kind of a brilliant idea. And as soon as you know that this question might make sense, you might actually end up uh, discovering this tut polynomial that I'm going to explain, well, right now. So let's just jump into the definition or the construction rather of the tut polynomial and then we go to the properties. So, and that's the, the properties of this polynomial or kind of the existence and the properties of this polynomial is kind of the theorem for today. Uh, so let's have a look. So the only notions we need to know, and it's kind of very natural notions in graph theory, are the notions of a loop and a bridge. So what is a loop? Well, a loop is this one here. Uh, I could draw another loop here or another or two at one vertex. So those are loops. A loop is just an edge that connects a vertex to itself, right? It's a loop. Very good. Okay. You need to know what a loop is. Um, the, and the loop will play a special role. And similarly, we need to know what a bridge is. So I, I'm kind of kind of loop kind of makes sense. Probably you would come up with this definition yourself. If you look at graphs long enough, um, loop is something that naturally comes up. Bridge is also something that naturally comes up, but it's a bit more subtle. Not, it's not hard, but it's a bit more subtle. And a bridge, uh, the red edges here are bridges. And a bridge is something, if you erase it, then you increase the number of connected components of a graph. So if I would erase this bridge, then this one and this one, they would be two separate connected components. So you, I would have increased the number of connected components of my graph, and that would be a bridge. And the bridges here are marked. So if you think about it, if you erase this one, then this guy will be separated from this piece here. And again, you would have increased the number of uh, connected components. So the, the deletion increases the number of connected components. And that's what's called a bridge, right? A loop and a bridge loops and bridges. And turns out, and this is really in hindsight, it was a really brilliant idea that loops and bridges plays a crucial role in defining kind of all graph polynomials out there um, in the following way. It's called the, uh, the following delete and contract operation. It's kind of always the same idea and it's illustrated here very nicely in this picture that I'm going to explain in a second. So I could delete a given edge Okay, I take a graph and I delete an edge. So this would be in deletion. Of course, the, the marked edge is the middle one, in this case, a red one. And if I delete it, I get this graph, right? If I delete the edge, I get the, uh, the other graph. Well, natural operation. You take an edge, choose it, you delete it, you get a new graph. Uh, so this is a deletion operation. And then you have the contraction operation, which is a bit more subtle, but also not very hard. Again, you choose your edge here, and you contract along the edge. So the, the two vertices along uh, to the neighboring vertices of the, of the edge, they just become one. They just contract to one vertex and you end up with this graph here where this vertex here in the middle was secretly was this vertex and this vertex before, right? They just contracted to one vertex. And kind of the algorithm is now you just continue. In every step you pick an edge, which is neither a loop nor a bridge. That's where our loops or bridges come in. So this middle edge here is neither a loop nor a bridge. You can, you can pick it, you contract, and uh, sorry, you delete to the left, you contract to the right, and, this, and then you go on. You delete, you contract, you delete, you contract, you delete, you contract, right? Delete, contract, delete, contract, and so on. Just how, depends, depending now on the graph, so you will get some kind of tree-like thing like here. And at one point, there won't be any edge to choose anymore, uh, either because you're running out of edges or, well, or kind of same in some sense, you're running out of non-loops and non-bridges. So this graph here, for example, you can't continue anymore because every edge here is a bridge, as you can see, right? So deleting it or uh, marking it and then deleting it would increase the number of connected components. So that's where you stop, okay? So you, you do this graph, you delete, you contract, you delete, you contract until you hit, well, you can't go on anymore. There's no deletion, there's no contraction anymore. So you just stop at that point, right? Here, I can't, I can't take the edge anymore. It's just a loop. Here, it's a bridge, and so on. And for each one of those, you kind of have an induction value. So the minimum, the value, and you kind of build inductively your polynomial by just adding everything up. So um, if uh, you have a tree with, uh, so just the, the, in the tree, you count the number of edges. So here are three edges: one, two, three, and you put an x to the three. One, two, you put an x2, x cubed, uh, sorry, x cubed, x squared. One, you put an x. For every loop, you put a y, okay? So here you have a, an x and a y, so you put an x, y, and so on, right? So every loop contributes a y, every remaining bridge contributes an x. And you just write one of those monomials, it will be an x to the m, 
and the y to the m for all of the endpoints of your graph, uh, of, of, your, of your tree here. So each one will be some x to the m, y to the n, right? And you just add them all up. And that's by definition your polynomial. So here I just add up all the vertices, uh, the, my end vertices, and I get this polynomial, the values for the end vertices. And that's the top poly, kind of fun algorithm. And it's absolutely not clear why this should produce anything reasonable. Actually, it's even not clear why it should be well defined because choosing a different edge in each step might affect the result, right? So this might not be well defined. I could have started by choosing this edge, for example, here, this one, and who knows whether I would have ended up with the same polynomial in the end. But we want a polynomial that only depends on the graph and not on our way of choosing of contracting or deletion. And the main theorem is that everything works. So deletion and contraction is really well defined. So we get a polynomial that only depends on the graph. And this polynomial has ridiculous properties. It's really amazing. So my subtitle was, um, let's go back to my subtitle. My subtitle was counting using polynomials. So it turns out that now you have a polynomial. As I said, it's kind of a sophisticated set of numbers associated to your, to your graph in this case. And it should evaluate your, your polynomial, your x, y polynomial, two variables on certain points, like two, one, 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 two, zero, whatever, more. Right. And all of these should somehow count something interesting related to the graph. And indeed, it does. And this is really, really amazing. Let me just, so here are just some uh, examples of what happens. So um, for example, t uh, x equals two. So this just means x equals two, y equals, so x is two, y is one. You just evaluate your polynomial at those values and you get a number. And this number is the number of forests, for example. You can get the number of spanning forests, you can get the number of subgraphs in a certain way, your orientations, connected components, blah, 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 blah. You can get a lot of information just encoded in one polynomial. And it's amazing. Right? I haven't stressed it often enough, or let me just really stress it. It's really amazing. It's an extremely efficient way to encode this information. It's in one polynomial, right? One polynomial associated to a graph knows all of these and even more, which I haven't even listed because my slide is not big enough. And yeah, this is just really, really good. Um, just be careful. There's one slight catch, like nothing in life is perfect. So of course, um, kind of well-definedness means that it only depends on the graph. So isomorphic graphs have the same polynomial, but the converse is not quite true. And you can kind of see this already, how this is built. Because, well, if you have a tree, for example, on a certain number of edges, then it would so always associate an X to the number of edges to, to that tree by, by kind of by construction. So it's kind of a little bit, dangerous to say that the graph is determined by um, the polynomial, so it's wrong, but a lot of properties of this graph is, are determined by the polynomial in a really, really efficient way, which I think is a pretty cool way of thinking about counting different uh, instances on the, uh, on the graph itself. It's pretty cool, actually, right? Um, yeah, and actually the, the top polynomial is even stronger, uh, kind of this is kind of history now backwards, but in some sense, it predated the Jones polynomial, the celebrated Jones polynomial uh, by quite a bit. And you can actually recover the Jones polynomial as a special, special case by evaluating y to be x inverse. That's something you can do as well, right? You can have two variables. Why not setting them equal or in this case, equal to the inverse? And you get a kind of a polynomial in one variable if you want, and it's inverse. Um, and it works as follows. It's kind of a cool trick. So you want to associate a polynomial now to a knot. And kind of in the same way, the polynomial should encode properties of the knot, and it should only depend on the knot. And this is absolutely non-trivial if you think about it. So here's a knot, a picture of a knot. It's kind of a string knotted in, in uh, three space, as you can see. Um, very nice picture. And this is how you do it. So the only uh, thing you need here is you need an alternating knot. So you need to go uh, over under and so on. Um, and actually you need an alternating knot would mean here, for example, you go under and the next one would go over because this is a different component. So you can do it for links as well. Just um, the, 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 the components itself, they need to be alternating. Anyway, so in this, uh, well, if you have this, you can actually associate a, a coloring, it's so-called checkerboard coloring to your knot, by just saying the outward region is white and then you, whenever you go across the crossing, it's just white 
and you just do uh, here, I go across the crossing, I do white again, I go across the crossing, I do white again. Uh, so this will be white again. And white, we already know that the outside is white. So this, I get this one, or let's me mark the black faces, black, 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 and you get the picture on the uh, right hand side. And then you can associate a graph to this knot by just putting a vertex in each um, component here. Uh, just in each black component and connect them across crossings, you get a graph. It will be a signed graph depending on, let's forget that. That's related to the alternating nonsense. Let's forget it. There will be a graph associated to your knot. And you take the tut polynomial of that graph for this value here. So for x equals this value, for y equals x inverse. And what you get is an invariant of the knot which is extremely strange. I mean, this is really, really surprising. You get topological invariant of a knot by using a graph polynomial. That's kind of cool. By just checkerboard coloring uh, things in an appropriate way. And actually for the experts, if you know what I'm talking about, this is a well-known polynomial that you get here uh, for the knot. It's called, it's a Jones polynomial. So the Tut polynomial in this sense generalizes the Jones polynomial, which again is kind of a pretty cool thing, right? From a graph to a knot, that seems to be a non-trivial step. Actually, it's not so bad. So it's right here on this slide. It's just a coloring and a, well, a kind of connecting across crossings algorithm. And yeah, that's that's what you get. And it's pretty cool. You can go from a graph to a knot and you get a topological invariant from a graph theoretical object, which is kind of a cool thing, right? Anyway, let me wrap up. So the Tut polynomial is this brilliant idea of very efficiently encoding information associated to a knot. Namely, uh, sorry, not to a knot, <laughs> of course not to a knot, to a graph, namely something like the number of forests, the number of blah, 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 in the following way. You have a polynomial and evaluating that polynomial at special points gives you back those numbers. Pretty cool idea. And it's one of the most famous not graph polynomials out there. And of course, if you know this idea, it's kind of kind of really interesting history here. If you know this idea, it's kind of obvious how to generalize that. And you can try yourself if you want. You get generalizations of those polynomials that count even, they're kind of even better for counting. And this was just a really nice beginning of the history of associating good polynomials to graphs, which I find a little bit mind blowing personally, because it's not quite obvious why this should actually make sense. As I said before, or as I had on a slide before, um, it's kind of really only a justification, at least for me. In hindsight, it has a very, the question, can, can you do this, has a very satisfying answer. But at least to me, as I said, it looks like it shouldn't be, right? It's kind of a weird concept associating a polynomial uh, to a graph, but it actually works really well and with an extremely efficient way of encoding information to a graph. Uh, anyway, I'm already waffling, so I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.